war, banana strike, banana massacre, banana gate, funding terrorists, what? There seems to be a darker side to Chiquita than just bananas in a grocery store. Well, in order to understand the scandals that are in the banana industry, we need to take a step back to 1870. Lorenzo Dalbaker purchased 160 bunches of bananas in Jamaica, and he then sailed to Jersey City where he sold them just 11 days later, and he made a nice profit. He then created the Boston Fruit Company. Miner C. Keith had signed a contract with the government of Costa Rica to build a railroad connecting the capital of San Jose to the port of Lyman in the Caribbean. He was a Central American railroad developer who began to grow banana trees in Costa Rica near his railroad. He did this to increase revenue to expand his railroad, and bananas also served as a cheap source of food for his workers. The government in Costa Rica had defaulted on its payments in 1882, and at that time, Keith had to borrow 1.2 million pounds from London banks and also private investors to actually continue this very difficult engineering project. In 1884, the president Prospero Fernandez Oriamuno gave Keith 800,000 acres, the equivalent to 3,000 200 square kilometers of tax-free land along the railroad plus a 99-year lease on the operation of the train route following a renegotiation of Costa Rica's debt. Once the railroad was completed in 1890, there wasn't enough passengers on the railroad Keith built to pay off his debt, but one thing was proving to be lucrative for him, which was his banana business. He ended up creating banana plantations, which were then cultivated and shipped to the US, which turned a massive profit for him. Then, in 1899, Keith lost $1.5 million when a broker in New York City went bankrupt, so he then had to travel to Boston, Massachusetts to participate in the merger of his banana trading company, Tropical Trading and Transport Company, with the rival Boston Fruit Company, the one the sea sailor Lorenzo Dow Baker and Baker's partner Andrew W. Preston formed. The merger created the company, the United Fruit Company. The Boston Fruit Company then bought their partnerships with plantations in the West Indies, a fleet of steamships, and a greater market in the Northeast US, and combined that with the Tropical Tropical Trading and Transport Company, which had plantations and railroads in Central America and a market in the South and Southeast of the US. The combined companies then exploded in growth to $11.23 million, and with that, the company then proceeded to buy 14 competitors. The business was booming, with Andrew W. Preston's lawyer, Bradley Palmer, being behind much of these business decisions, and Palmer even went to become a consultant to presidents and an advisor to Congress. Then, in 1901, the government in Guatemala had had even hired the United Fruit Company to manage their postal service. By 1930, it had continued to buy and absorb more than 20 rival firms, acquiring a capital of $215 million, the equivalent to almost $4 billion today, and the brand became the largest employer in Central America. The United Fruit Company at this point had a major role in most countries and national economies in the region, and the company then eventually would start to become a symbol of the exploitative export economy. In 1928, there was the Banana Massacre. This was actually one of the most notorious strikes by the workers of United Fruit. This took place in Colombia, and the Colombian army, under command of General Cortez Vargas, even opened fire on a crowd of strikers in the central square of Siniaga. Then, in 1934, there was the Great Banana Strike. The workers of the United Fruit Company were fed up with the working conditions and underpay, and around much of the 100,000 workers went on strike. The company and brand then went on a campaign to brand the strike as a communist insurrection, which the government in Costa Rica accepted. Laws weren't signed to better the conditions of the workers until years later. By the 1930s, the United Fruit Company owned 3.5 million acres, or 14,000 square kilometers of land in Central America and the Caribbean. Being. This ultimately led to the coining of the phrase Banana Republic because the company had such great power of the governments of these countries. In 1952, the government of Guatemala started to use the unused land of the United Fruit Company to give to landless individuals. The company then responded by lobbying the US government to intervene, and United Fruit also started a few campaigns portraying the Guatemalan government as communist. And in 1954, the CIA, or Central Intelligence Agency of the US, forcefully removed the the current government of Guatemala, and then installed a pro-business military dictatorship. In 1970, Eli M. Black bought 733,000 shares of United Fruit, becoming the largest shareholder. And from there, he merged United Fruit with his own public company, AMK, to create the United Brands Company. But Black didn't know that United Fruit had far less cash than he counted on, and Black's mismanagement led to United Fruits becoming crippled with debt. 
Then in 1874, Hurricane Fifi destroyed many plantations in Honduras, which exacerbated the company's losses. On February 3rd of 1975, Black ended his life after jumping out of his office on the 44th floor of the Pan Am building in New York City. Later that year, the US Securities and Exchange Commission exposed a scheme by United Brands, dubbed Bananagate, to bribe Honduran President Oswaldo Lopez Arellano with $1.25 million, plus the promise of another $1.25 million upon the reduction of certain export taxes. After this was exposed, trading in United Brands stock was halted. This reduction actually saved United Brands company about $7.5 million in tax payments. In addition, it was discovered that United Brands company had paid another $750,000 in bribes to an Italian official to prevent restrictions on United's banana exports to Italy beginning in 1970. And believe it or not, but it was not illegal at the time for US companies to bribe officials, but it was illegal for companies to hide such bribes from their stockholders. And United Brands also admitted to trying to convince the SEC that the bribes should be kept secret. Once the bribe was revealed, it provoked the overthrow of the military government in Honduras, and this in turn led to the nationalization of United's railways along the large portion of land that was held by the company. After Black's suicide, Cincinnati-based American financial group billionaire Carl Lindener Jr. bought into United Brands, and later in 1984, Lindener took control of the company and renamed it to the brand that we all know today, Chiquita Brands International. Once the company began expanding and growing in the early years, United Fruit was off to a bad start. Being frequently accused of bribing government officials in exchange for preferential treatment, exploiting its workers, paying little by way of taxes to governments of the countries where it operated, and working ruthlessly to consolidate monopolies. Journalists in the areas even called the company El Pulpo, or The Octopus, to describe the company as having many arms and expanding. There were even songs written about the company describing the overworked peasants overseen by wealthy managers, and lots of the inhabitants of these areas did not like the company operating in their country as a quote, tyranny. The idea of growing trees sounds like an environmentally conscious thing to do, but in reality, United Fruits Company's process of creating a plantation and farming bananas had noticeable effects on the environment. Infrastructure built by the company was constructed by clearing out forests, filling in low and swampy areas, and installing sewage, drainage, and water systems. So the ecosystems that did exist on those lands were then destroyed. The idea of starting a company in a developing country sounds great. You bring jobs, you improve the infrastructure structure and improve the economy, but United Fruit Company was known to have bad long-term effects on countries. The company built lots of railroads and ports and provided employment and transportation and created numerous schools for the people who lived and worked in the company. But it also discouraged the governments from building highways, which would have lessened the profitable transportation monopoly of the railroads under its control. In 2007, Chiquita Brands pleaded guilty in a United States federal court to aiding a terrorist organization. The company admitted to the the payment of more than $1.7 million to the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia, or AUC, which is a group that the U.S. has labeled a terrorist organization since 2001. Under a plea agreement, Chiquita Brands agreed to pay $25 million in restitution and damages to the families of the victims of the AUC, and the AUC was paid in the first place to protect the company's interests in the region. And in addition to the payments, Chiquita has also been accused of smuggling 3,000 AK-47s to the AUC and in assisting the AUC and smuggling drugs to Europe. Chiquita Brands even admitted that they paid AUC operatives to silence union organizers and intimidate farmers to selling only to Chiquita. And the Colombia government let Chiquita Brands keep the names of the US citizens who brokered this agreement with the AUC secret in exchange for relief to 390 families. Colombian authorities and human rights organizations attempted to call the US Department of Justice to extradite the US citizens responsible for war crimes and aiding a terrorist organization organization, and the Department of Justice refused to grant the request, citing conflicts of law, but there were eight people mostly involved in it, and apparently they have since been fired. And that brings us to where we are today. So don't slip up with an inferior brand. When it says Chiquita, it's a very good day to buy bananas.